Come look at the light. Oh. <coughs> um, I don't even know what that's supposed to be. Uh, good morning. Uh, today we're going to have uh, some fun facts about photophobia. Uh, so I'm going to start off uh, by talking a little bit about the clinical characteristics that are associated with light sensitivity. Uh, we know a lot more about the pathophysiology of light sensitivity than we did 15 years ago. And uh, I don't think the ophthalmic textbooks have caught up. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some clinical research we're doing uh, using specially designed uh, optical notch filters for treating light sensitivity. Uh, so photophobia just means abnormal intolerance to light. Um, there are some other similar uh, syndromes like photooculodynia, which is a syndrome of light sensitivity and eye pain uh, following an eye injury or surgery. And there's central dazzle that's more associated with tumors and strokes that are, rel they're bo those are both relatively uncommon, whereas an abnormal intolerance to light is, I'd say, relatively common and certainly way more common than the other syndromes. So there are a lot of ophthalmic conditions that are associated with light sensitivity. Uh, but the thing is, is that almost all of these have at least some other sign and or symptom associated with them that's going to help you as an ophthalmologist tell that that's what the underlying problem is. It's not just primarily photophobia. It's due to some underlying condition. And then there are also some underlying neurologic conditions that are associated with um, photophobia. Uh, but again, almost all of those have signs and or symptoms that are going to help you uh, differentiate it from just plain old light sensitivity that doesn't seem to have an underlying cause that's obvious on exam. So uh, many of you know that I split my time between comprehensive ophthalmology and neuro-ophthalmology. And so I can tell you that in my general ophthalmology practice, just whoever walks in the door practice, that the most common uh, underlying conditions that I have seen associated with patients who present with a chief complaint of photophobia are going to be migraine, blepharospasm, and TBI. Uh, migraine outnumbers those other two put together probably three to one, at least. Uh, so there was a very unfortunate paper that was published by the group at Emory a few years ago where they said, where they said the sunglasses sign is a, um, a sign of functional vision loss. And so they uh, looked at 1,300 new neuro-ophthalmology neuro patients that they saw over 13 months. 34 of those 1,300 patients showed up wearing sunglasses. And the majority of them had turned out to have non-organic vision loss. Uh, seven of them did have organic vision loss for which wearing sunglasses was an appropriate uh, treatment. And the take-home message from the paper was if you have a patient come in wearing sunglasses, they're probably functional. But that has not been my experience in neuro-ophthalmology, and it's definitely not been my experience in my comprehensive ophthalmology practice. And I think the unfortunate thing is that people reading that article would extrapolate the results from Emory, which is a tertiary neuro-ophthalmology service, to their comprehensive ophthalmology service or their cornea service. Uh, and it's just not appropriate. It, in my experience, yeah, I do have some functional patients that come in wearing sunglasses. But most of the patients in my practice wearing sunglasses really have something wrong with them, and it's usually migraine, blepharospasm, or traumatic brain injury. So a uh, brief review of migraine because it's so prevalent. Almost one in five women have migraine at some point in their life. It's a huge number. It's the far and away the most common neurologic condition. It affects about 6% of men, still c very common. Um, and migraines, I think, uh, especially amongst the lay public, have a rep as just being like a bad headache. But they're really not. They really can be very disabling for some people because of the light and sound sensitivity, nausea and vomiting. They can last, you know, several hours, end up missing 
work, missing social functions, not being able to enjoy time with your family and friends. I mean, it's really a serious condition. It affects 31 million Americans or that have episodic migraine. There are 14 million Americans roughly with chronic migraine. Chronic migraine is defined as uh, at least 15 headache days per month for three months in a row at least. That's, that's a lot of headaches. Uh, we spend about $2 billion annually on prescription drugs for treatment of migraine. And it's estimated that we lose about $13 billion annually in hospital activity due to migraine. Uh, sometimes it's not real helpful to ask somebody if they have migraines. I mean, sometimes they do, and they know, and they say, yeah, I have migraines. But a lot of times they've either been un they're either undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. And so this is a really quick three questions that you can ask about somebody's headaches that will tell you that they more likely have migraine and less likely have tension headache or some other headache syndrome. And it's just these three questions. If they answer positively for one or more, it's, it's, it's fairly sensitive to migraine. Okay, so now I'm going to turn away from talking about the um, some of the clinical characteristics of photophobia and talk a little bit more about the pathophysiology. This is not a for sure thing, but a lot of evidence seems to be pointing toward the fact uh, that these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells in the retina are, are likely have a lot to do with the pathophysiology of abnormal light sensitivity. These are also called melanopsin cells because they contain the photopigment melanopsin. Uh, these cells are definitely responsible for cir circadian rhythm entrainment. So your body has a natural 24-hour cycle. If you Start, if you stick a person in a cave with no light, no clock, uh, no access to any sort of clues to what time it is, their body will still maintain a roughly 24-hour schedule of sleeping and eating. <coughs> if you travel from Salt Lake City to Sydney, Australia, where they're about 12 hours out of sync with us, over s several days, your body will eventually adapt to the local uh, light dark cycle and you'll be sleeping at night and eating meals at the same time as the Australians. It's these cells that resynchronize your internal clock to the local light dark uh, cycle. These cells are plugged directly into the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus and they uh, re help keep your body synchronized to that 24 hour cycle, keep you synchronized to the sun coming up and the sun going down. They're also responsible for pupillary constriction. So when light hits your eye, both pupils constrict. These cells are uh, plugged right into the um, pretectal nucleus in the brainstem and then to the edinger westphal nucleus. So these cells constrict your pupil when the light gets bright. And there's uh, very good evidence, uh, at least in rats, that uh, these cells are also responsible for pain. So if you look at a light that's too bright, it hurts. It physically is painful to look at a light that's too bright. And it's probably these cells that, um, uh, that uh, are the basis of that pathway, that pain pathway. So, you know, here's your good old blue, green, and red photoreceptor receptors and your rod photoreceptors. And the, the story that I was told when I was in medical school is that these cells connect to bipolar cells and then you've got amigrin cells and then horizontal cells and eventually ganglion cells and the ganglion cells send their axons out through the optic nerve to the chiasm to the tracts and then to the lateral geniculate in the thalamus. Well it turns out that about 10 percent of the ganglion cells in your retina don't go to the lateral geniculate. They go to at least three other places in your brain. Uh, one of them is the suprachiasmatic nucleus that I was just describing for entrainment of circadian rhythms. One is the um, uh, olivary pontine nucleus in the pretectal brain stem that goes to the edinger westphal nucleus and then <coughs> uh, constricts your pupils. And then there's a third pathway that appears to go to the posterior thalamus, uh, which is, uh, those are pain centers in your thalamus that it's wired to. Uh, these cells, the unique thing about these cells is not only do they receive input from the cones and rods, they're also intrinsically photosensitive. They contain a photopigment, just like rods and cones contain a photopigment. 
and you can stimulate these cells directly without any input from rods and cones, and you can still get circadian rhythm entrainment, pupillary constriction, and pain. And actually, Dr. Digri has a cohort of patients with retinitis pigmentosa who are exquisitely light sensitive. These people are legally blind, and yet they're light sensitive. That doesn't make any sense. How could the blind person be light sensitive? Well, it actually does make sense, because their photoreceptors might be wiped out, but the ganglion cells aren't. And the ganglion cells still work. They still uh, entrain their circadian rhythms. They still constrict the pupil, and they still cause pain. So this is a light-sensitive pathway that has nothing to do with vision, nothing to do with seeing, nothing to do with image formation. <coughs> if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty of photophobia and some of the other circuits that are likely involved with the sensation of pain from a bright light, uh, Dr. Digri and Casey Brennan, who's one of our headache specialists in the Department of Neurology, wrote a review in JNO about three years ago, and this is one of the primary figures from that article. And the, the take-home message is that uh, not only does do these intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells, uh, which are abbreviated here as IPRGC, transmit, you know, through the optic nerve eventually to the posterior thalamus. But the posterior thalamus also gets some afferent input from meningeal pain fibers. Uh, it's connected very closely with the trigeminal nerve, which of course is not only the nerve that supplies sensation to your eye in orbit and face, but also the nerve that's <coughs> implicated in the pathogenesis of migraine. And there's also some, some other bizarre connections with the superior salivatory nucleus, the teropontine uh, ganglion in the eye, and also some weird melanopsin cells that are in the iris. There might be some uh, pain pathways <coughs> that are separate from the optic nerve that are uh, transmitted directly through the trigeminal nerve and the uh, trigeminal nerve innervation of the eye. So it's probably not, not as simple as intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, there's probably some other circuits involved too, involved with light sensitivity. So I, I'm pr I think it seems pretty clear that this is a protective mechanism. I think all vertebrates have this mechanism and it keeps you from burning up your retina by looking at a light that's too bright. It's a, it's, it's causes pain so that you don't ruin your retina. But I think in some people, especially people with migraine, this system just has too much gain. It, it causes light sensitivity and pain at light levels that are that most people find to be very comfortable and that are safe. A funny thing that I've noticed over time about people with uh, light sensitivity, especially people who come in with a chief complaint of light sensitivity, is that it's, and it's, I didn't figure this out myself, like they told me, it, it's non-incandescent artificial light that really bothers them. They specifically don't like fluorescent lights. They don't like those big gas discharge lights that you see in Lowe's and Home Depot and Costco. And they don't like computer screens. And regular old light bulbs, they're fine with that. Being outside where it's actually brighter doesn't bother them that much. It's these indoor lights, these artificial indoor lights that bug them. And I think there's an explanation for that too, although I th I'm, a I'm kind of on thin ground here. So if you look at the, the uh, skin eyes, sorry. If you look at the, s the, the uh, emission of the sun, you know, using wavelength down here as your x-axis, the sun emits at sort of a Gaussian curve across the visible spectrum, going from infrared to visible light and then to ultraviolet. And the human sensitivity to light also is sort of a Gaussian curve uh, here, just within a narrow range of light, you know, between red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet that we're sensitive to. And I, I don't think this is a coincidence. I think that uh, vertebrate eyes have evolved under the sun and they're sensitive at the same sort of wavelengths that the sun maximally emits. <coughs> Makes sense. If you look at the emission over wavelength of a tungsten filament, which is the working parts of the inside of, a incan of an incandescent light bulb, it also has kind of a Gaussian curve to it because it's a burning filament, just like the sun is a gi gigantic burning filament. And it emits at sort of a Gaussian uh, uh, wavelength um, function, just like the sun does. 
But if you look at the emission of fluorescent lights, they're very, that's what's displayed here with these little spikes. It's very spiky, so fluorescent lights emit very strongly at some wavelengths and not at all at other wavelengths. It's, it's, and it looks good and it works well, but it's very, if you want to say unnatural, it's very unlike the sun. And I think there's something about this. These it used to be thought that the reason that fluorescent lights bugged people was because of the a little bit of a flicker they have in them, but that's largely been gotten rid of with modern fluorescent lights, and people are still don't like them. And I think it's this uh, spiky emission spectrum that bugs people. Some people. Uh, sorry, my slides got messed up. There we go. Okay, so how do you treat people with light sensitivities? You want to treat the underlying conditions. So if they have dry eye or they have iritis or they have, well, I guess you can't really treat albinism, but uh, if they have migraine, blepharospasm, traumatic brain injury, you want to get them treatment for that condition. There are no medical treatments <coughs> for photophobia at this time, uh, but optical treatments are available. <coughs> uh, some of my blepharospasm and migraine patients come in wearing sunglasses, and you really don't want to do that because <coughs> I think that dark adapts the retina, and so when they do take off their sunglasses, their light sensitivity is actually worse than when they put them on, and so I really try to discourage that. There's this tint called FL41, which I'll talk more about, uh, that is really good for migraine, and actually research from, from our group here at Utah has shown that it's effective in blepharospasm. And this tint is light enough that it doesn't dark adapt your eyes, but still makes people more comfortable. And for some people, the, um, the difference can be really dramatic. It's this rose-colored tint. Uh, there's nothing proprietary about it. There's a couple of companies in the U.S. that manufacture this tint, and <coughs> any optical shop can get it, but very few do carry it. Our optical shop here does, and they know a lot about FL41 and uh, help them. That's right. <laughs> Here's proof. Um, uh, you can also make this in a contact lens, uh, which wasn't available until very recently. And we have that at our optical shop here at the Milan. Um, uh, so this, this tint was discovered empirically in, uh, in Britain. They had a cohort of patients that didn't like fluorescent lights. And they just put out a whole bunch of different colored glasses and let people try on blue ones and green ones and yellow ones and red ones. And just by trial and error, they came up with this tint that seemed to help people with fluorescent light sensitivity. Um, a few years later, um, they put these glasses on a cohort of uh, school children with migraines and found that it seemed to reduce the frequency and severity of their migraine headaches. And uh, since that time, uh, Dr. Digri has been prescribing it for a lot of her light sensitive patients, especially those with migraine and blepharospasm. And, uh, you know, we put these glasses on a cohort of blepharospasm patients, it's probably been about 10 years ago now, and showed that it reduced the, not only their symptoms of blinking and squeezing, but also with electromyographic recording, we could show that wearing these glasses actually made them squeeze less and made them squeeze less hard. If you look at the spectral characteristic of FL41, which is plotted here in blue, compared to just a pair of like neutral gray tinted sunglasses that you can pick up at the drugstore, you'll see that the gray is relatively flat across the visible spectrum, whereas FL41 has this dip around 500 nanometers. Now, if you look at the spectral sensitivity of melanopsin, the photopigment that's in those intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, it peaks at about that same wavelength. And so up here, um, I've, plot, uh, we've, I've taken from an article the maximum sensitivity of the red, green, and blue cones. And then also rhodopsin is stuck in here. And this OPN4, this is melanopsin. This is the maximum sensitivity of that photopigment. It falls roughly halfway between green and blue just off of rhodopsin, and it peaks right at about 480 <coughs> nanometers, very close to the wavelength that FL41 blocks. And that 
when I saw these data in early 2000s, I was like, well, maybe that's why FL41 works because it blocks the same wavelength of light that these pain cells are maximally sensitive at. So prior to that, there was really no science behind FL41, right? It was just discovered empirically, trial and error, and it really never got much traction, I think because it just seemed like magic glasses with no science behind it. And I think doctors especially were very skeptical of its efficacy, and it just never, it never caught on. And that's why most people haven't heard of it. Most optical shops don't carry it. But now I think there is some science behind it. And when I saw these curves, I was like, well, now that I think, or I know, I think I know why FL41 works, I can make something better. I can look, I can take this transmission curve of FL41, and if I can make this uh, minimum transmission here lower, sorry, I don't know why my cursor keeps disappearing, I can make something better. So I hooked up with, oh, this is a little uh, a side topic before I go on to the glasses. Um, I actually think this is the most fascinating part of the whole story, but it, it, um, clinically it's less relevant. If you look at a vertebrate <coughs> photoreceptor and how it works, uh, you have opsin, it's transmembrane protein that's coupled to a retinal molecule, and when light hits it, the 11 cis retinal is isomerized to all trans retinal, and that causes a conformational change in the opsin, which then activates a G protein, phosphodiesterase is activated, which hydrolyzes cyclic GMP, and then you have this transmembrane um, <coughs> uh, ionic channel that gets closed. All right, that's how vertebrate photoreceptors work. If you look at an invertebrate eye, it's actually very similar. You have a similar, not identical, but very similar opsin, that's coupled to the exact same retinol molecule. Light isomerizes it from 11 cis to all trans retinol. But then some of the intracellular machinery is different, but ultimately it also results in closure of a transmembrane ionic channel. So vertebrate and invertebrate uh, photoreceptors work in a very similar fashion with very similar molecules. And there's now genetic evidence, like if you look at the genes that are expressed in an invertebrate photoreceptor and the genes that are expressed in a vertebrate photoreceptor, there's very good evidence that these, that our photoreceptors, even though they look, like if you look at an invertebrate eye and a vertebrate eye, they look completely different, but there's very good evidence that the photoreceptors evolved from a common ancestor. Uh, and <coughs> not only that, the better part is that the uh, rods and cones and bipolar cells all have very, all share a common ancestor and share similar gene expression, whereas amicum cells, ganglion cells, horizontal cells actually sh look like they evolved from a slightly different ancestor that's a lot more like the invertebrate photoreceptors. So all of these cells in your retina evolved from a common ancestor, but at some point there was a split where the rods and cones and bipolar cells kind of had their own sort of development. Amicum cells, horizontal cells, ganglion cells had their own development and their specialization. Uh, and, and that set of cells is a lot more like our invertebrate um, uh, common cousins. Uh, these melanopsin cells, the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, if you look at the genes that are expressed in that cell, it looks a lot more, even though it's a, it's a photosensitive cell and it's in a human retina, it looks a lot more like an invertebrate photoreceptor than it does look like a rod or a cone. And the melanopsin molecule itself looks more like an invertebrate uh, photopigment than it does look like rhodopsin or the conopsins. So in your human retina is this vestige of a common ancestor that we share with invertebrates. Okay, so now I'm back from my digression. So I was thinking, okay, if I know why FL41 works, I can make something better. So I got in touch with a, um, an engineer in electrical engineering here on main campus and 
he said, you know, I don't, I think with as far as tints go, organic dyes, I think that FL41 is as good as you can make it. But if we're going to make something that blocks more strongly at the wavelengths that uh, you want to block, uh, we're going to need a different technology. And so what he uh, recommended were what are called thin films. And so thin films are very, very ultra thin layers of metal oxides that are applied to the surface of a spectacle lens. And if you apply the layers in a certain order and they're of a certain thickness and a certain composition, you can get all kinds of optical properties. And it's these thin film, it's that thin film technology that we use to make anti-reflective coatings that are almost ubiquitous on spectacle, spectacle lenses. Uh, thin films are what are used to make mirror coatings like on, on sunglasses. Um, but it turns out that you can make a notch filter. You can make a filter that just blocks 480, the same wavelength that stimulates melanopsin cells, uh, by using this technology. And so here's just a schematic diagram of, of an example of a, uh, of a thin film uh, notch filter where you've got on the, on the substrate surface, you've got titanium dioxide that's 165 nanometers thick and then a layer of silicon dioxide that's 40 nanometers thick, and then titanium again and silicon again, and then at the top you've got this layer of mag fluoride. These are all um, uh, metal oxides, very, very thin layers, and it just turns out that this combination of layers in this order with these thicknesses gives you a notch filter at 480. So we uh, developed a clinical trial to test these out and see, you know, can we really make people with migraine better? And so we designed two notches. We designed a 480 nanometer notch, and as a sham, we developed a 620 nanometer notch. Uh, the reason I picked 620 uh, uh, is because if you look at the maximum sensitivity of the human eye, it peaks right here around 540 nanometers. Our notch filter at 480 was kind of landed over here, and so I said, let's pick something that's on the complete opposite end of the uh, human um, uh, uh, light sensitivity spectrum, and then that'll be our sham filter. So we had two, two filters, and this is what they looked like. The one on the right is the 480 filter. You can see it has kind of a little bit of a bluish reflection on it, and the one on the left is the 590 uh, notch, that, or the six. 620 notch, which has more of a green, kind of a greeny yellow kind of reflection on the surface. Uh, we randomized 48 subjects with chronic migraine to wearing either the 480 or the 620 lenses for two weeks. Then they wore nothing for two weeks, and then they switched. They so each patient served as their own control, and they wore the other lenses, and then um, uh, and then uh, we determined which lens seemed to help their migraines and their light sensitivity better. Our primary outcome was the headache impact test. That's a six question um, instrument. Uh, it's a lot, clinicians like this test, clinicians who take care of headaches like this a lot better than just asking people to keep a diary of their headaches because it really gets at how are the headaches affecting your life. We're less interested in how many headaches you're having or how severe your headaches are or whether or not you wound up in the emergency room, we're more interested in how do these headaches affect your ability to go to work, enjoy your family, um, uh, enjoy your life, really. Uh, the hit six questions are all scored on a scale of six to 13 each question. So the minimum score is 36, the maximum score is 78. And then and you interpret it, if your score is 49 or less, then your headaches are having little impact, and then 50 to 55 is some. 56, 59 is substantial, and then if you score 60 or more, that's then that's considered to be evidence that your headaches are having a very severe impact on your life. And it turned out of the 48 patients that we randomized with chronic migraine, uh, I think 90% of them were in that category of very severe. It turned out that both the 480 and the 620 lens were helpful, and if you look at the the if you look at the compound effect of the two lenses over the time of the trial, so the average hit six score in these 48 patients was about 65 at the beginning of the trial. When they were wearing either of the lenses, it dropped by about four points. During the washout period, it popped back up a little bit. And then during the second trial, it went back down again. And then when they took the glasses off, it went back up. So I thought this was pretty good evidence that the glasses were having some sort of an effect 
But what wasn't clear when I initially looked at the data was why my sham lens was working as well as my placebo. It turns out that it was my ignorance of invertebrate photoreceptor physiology that uh, may have affected the trial. So uh, you may remember, if you're an ophthalmology resident and taking the OCAP, you'll hopefully remember that the in order for to for you to get that 11 of that all trans retinal isomerized back into 11 cis retinal so it can be ready for the next photon, it has to leave the photoreceptor, be transported to the retinal pigment epithelium, recycled in you know over a, a number of enzymatic steps, and then transported back to the photoreceptor. Invertebrate eyes don't have a retinal pigment epithelium. At least I don't think they do. It turns out that um, invertebrate photo pigments are bistable and that one wavelength of light, that's lambda 1, isomerizes the molecule from its all, its 11 cis to its all trans form and then a different wavelength of light, lambda 2, isomerizes it back to its active form. If you look at mouse melanopsin, uh, it's 480 nanometer light, roughly, that um, isomerizes melanopsin uh, from its active state to its inactive state and activates the cell. And it's 590 nanometer light that isomerizes it back from its inactive state to its active state. And so I think this is why we got an effect from the lens that I think was a, that I had designed as a sham. And there's, and there's actually clinical evidence, um, oh, who was it? There was a guy a couple of years ago, he took a bunch of people and he had them take a test and he was interested in the uh, effect of different wavelengths of light and how it affects your test taking ability. And he showed that if you had people under uh, 590 light, that was a 6020, yeah, 590 light, that they did better on this cognitive test. And so there is, there is something magic about that wavelength of light apparently. And of course, if you think about the ganglion cell where it is in the retina, there's no way it can send its melanopsin to the retinal pigment epithelium. It's, you know, it's hundreds of microns away. So um, uh, it has to have some way to isomerize its uh, photopigment back and forth between its active and inactive state. So I think that's the plausible uh, explanation for why my sham lens seemed to be an, uh, an active lens. And actually, these data were just accepted by the Journal of Clinical Neuroscience and revising it right now. And hopefully, it'll be published later in 2015. Okay, so getting back to treatment. Uh, uh, we also, uh, Krista Kennard, our neuro-ophthalmology fellow two years ago uh, and former resident, she did a, a, a study while she was a fellow of corneal nerves in patients with chronic migraine using confocal microscopy. And she showed that not only do these chronic migraine patients have some alterations in their corneal innervation, but every single one of them had dry eye symptoms, which was something we were not expecting. And so I think that dry eye is, is going to be very, is probably universal in patients with chronic migraine, and certainly migraine that's bad enough to have them come to the eye doctor with photophobia. So treat their dry eye, and we all know how to treat dry eye. FL41 tint is commercially available. That's that rose-colored tint. Um, I've had so many people over the years ask me, where can I get this tint? Where can I get this tint? Where can I get this tint? I was like, and you know, some people could mail things into the Moran Eye Center, but it's hard, like if you live in Sydney, Australia, to get FL41 glasses from the Moran Eye Center. And so I founded an online company, Axon Optics. We sell FL41 glasses online. We ship all over the world. We ship contact lenses. We do prescription, non-prescription. We have a variety of frames. And it's not, like if you have a patient here in Salt Lake, you want to send them to the optical shops because they can fit their frames properly and they can adjust them and they can get it just right. Whereas if you have a patient that lives far away, it's, it's, it's really a lot easier to work <coughs> through the uh, internet and, and get them through Axon Optics. The thin film coatings that I described uh, for that clinical trial are not commercially available. Uh, we are now going through the FDA approval process because I want to I want to market them as a treatment for migraine. Um, uh, so you can't buy those, uh, but we are starting a clinical trial, a, a new clinical trial soon. We do have a pediatric and adolescent migraine study going on next door at Primary Children's. 
So if you happen to know somebody, a kid, 18 or younger, 8 to 18, I think is our age inclusion group with migraine, they might be eligible for the study. It's listed on clinicaltrials.gov. So photophobia is a common accompaniment of some common ophthalmic and neurologic conditions. Many of us forget to treat this facet of the disease. Many optical treatments are currently available. They're, in, they're very cheap and they, they seem to work and they don't have side effects. And that I think some newer optical treatments are on the horizon that might provide <coughs> better treatments for light sensitivity, sensitivity, migraine, blepharospasm, and traumatic brain injury. Okay, thanks for your attention. Yeah, Bala. I'm trying to describe my brain as a bush, and it's very sensitive. And I'm trying to think of some examples. Are there specific conditions that you might have affected in your brain that are really strong symptoms that are affected in the absence of a treatment that you would think would have been successful in terms of treating the symptoms? Yes, exactly. So there, uh, there are not FL41 tinted computer screens available. Um, uh, we're actually working on a nanoparticle filter that you could put on a computer screen. That's another patent and another R&D project. But um, uh, I think eventually we will be able to make something that has the same not filter effect. Com computer screens and TV screens are really interesting because they primarily use blue LEDs. And the, that blue wavelength is very close to the maximum sensitivity of melanopsin. And I think that's why they're these screens, these modern screens, are irritating to people. And also, I think it's why a lot of us are having trouble sleeping, because we're all on our screens at night when we're in bed, and we're stimulating these cells, and we're telling our suprachiasmatic nucleus it's time to be awake, and it's actually time to be asleep. Uh, so the new trial, uh, yeah, the sham filter is going to be a neutral density gray filter that has the same darkness across the visible spectrum, but doesn't have the notch filter. So. Yeah, Dr. Lee. So, uh, <coughs> Right. Nobody definitively has shown that one way or the other. These guys probably have very nice studies. But we know that there is some very impressive evidence for the geriatric surgery that are doing cataract surgery, allowing now better photo screening. <coughs> uh -huh. We've got these cataract swab all sitting in the blue light. Yep. Brain. Yeah. Dramatically, when you do that, you, you not only enhance the completeness of the melanopsin, but you actually impact the cereal ability to see. Wow. Yeah. There are other aspects of that. Right. Um, and uh, uh, there's actually a group here on, uh, in Research Park that's interested in using uh, blue light as a treatment for Parkinson's disease. And I, I'm, I'm sure that in what you're saying are connected somehow. And SAD also treating epileptic of course. disorders. Yes. Which, which classically showed, uh, at least from my own recent institution, you, you, you go in and you get all the, uh, well, of course, like nuclear stunning. But the big emphasis is blue light. Uh, Dr. Warner. Yeah, so we're, we haven't been tracking depression. We are tracking hours of sl sleep each day, um, but um, uh, I hadn't thought about tracking class, depression. Four and the five, and there's, there's a lot of feeling that the, that the depression in the rest of the motor cortex is much further in the blue, and you're giving them something that's blue light, which is interesting to follow up further. But remember, there, there are two different Right. You've got one that's REM, green REM, and one that's a no REM. Right. No REM seems to be more trigeminal. The other seems to be a bit more in the three AM part for the, the, the wake sleep later. So you may actually find that they've got plenty of blue, but you've been cutting down on one or two of them more and more, pl playing with air. This very brain, I'm not telling you everybody, yeah. this is something that even our top retinal physiologists have never heard of that, what, 12 years ago? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. it's very new. Um, sorry, I think Paul had a question. Um, okay. Um, it's like between improving the precise point and the long range, yes. can't you complain about that range like that? Or not? Or is it just 
um, you know, it's really it's really hard to say because uh, because like fluorescent lights and computer screens and these gas discharge lamps all d all <coughs> emit at different wavelengths across the visible spectrum, and I'm not I'm not sure, and I'm not sure it matters actually because if let's say it's just blue light that bugs you, uh, blocking uh, the 620 light is still going to have a, an effect because if you're not re-isomerizing the melanopsin back to its active state, if you're, block if you're photochemically blocking it from being enzymatically restored to its uh, original active state, you will still get a therapeutic effect even if that's not the wavelength of light that bugs you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure that, yeah, I'd like to see that. I'm sure that, I'm sure that's true. I'm, I mean, it, that is not somewhere that I've spent a lot of research time on and up more about. Uh, yeah. So you know that blue color lights are all bad for you, probably the light that you're looking at. Uh, we also know that magenta and other yellow colored lights are harmful to you. And there's obviously a science there that you have a certain argument for all the time, but have right. you considered like You know, I haven't just because it's such an uncommon condition. But I think it's a great idea, and, I, and, it, and it might very well be very effective for them. Yeah. Pardon? Maybe for that reason, the fact that you have the two illusions of all of the spectrum and all yeah. the things, and the fact that it cannot stop you while you're having the illusion of having particularly the melanopsin light, but you know that it's all harmful to you as well. Oh, right. And looking at, yeah. I, yeah. Actually, the reason that makes everything more sensitive mm -hmm. is they're dropping out and so the visual spectrum. Yeah, exactly. So that's what makes it all so complicated. And then the kids are real kids are flipping in so they have lost their elder sense. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut off questions so we have time for our last speaker, but I'd be happy but to I talk to anybody. I got one announcement before yeah. we go to the last yeah. speaker. I apologize.